Elwood City Limits. This is the Episodic Arthur Podcast. I am your host, Will Young, and with me as always is Are You Afraid of the Dark cast member? <laughs> That's Lucas right, Mancini. cast and crew. Uh, I bought a Are You in the Afraid of the Dark crew jacket uh, this weekend. There was a yard sale on my street, and they were selling that. And I think the, one of the reasons that I'm glad you brought it up on the podcast. Um, for those of you listening at home who don't follow me on Instagram, is that uh, it's got the CNAR logo at the bottom, which mm. lets you know that it's an authentic, you know, Canadian production uh, jacket. But uh, longtime listeners will remember CNAR as the company behind the early seasons of Arthur. That's right. Uh, it, it has a new name these days, and I'm, it's, I'm blanking on what exactly it is. But it is still uh, alive to some degree. But yes, I saw that on your Instagram story, and I was insanely jealous. But I, I am glad that it was a yard sale find. By the way, great, great yard sale find. I, only just because I thought maybe you inherited it from an actual crew member, or uh, perhaps you had a That's family right. member. Ryan who... Gosling himself actually gave it to me. Uh, or or that or that guy with the tall kid with, with the glasses who works for the Weather Network. <laughs> all all those people, yeah, yeah. Um, no, no, it was it was just by a happenstance, and I was on the fence about it because it was quite pricey. I think the guy knew what he had, mm. but saw that Cenar logo, and I said, "Listen, as a, a children's television." if not Canadian children's television historian, I simply had to cop, Will. Mm. Now, maybe I I know it's a little bit, uh, eh, it's maybe not the proper to ask about prices, but if possible, can you give me like a ballpark of what we're talking Uh, about uh, for you? Enough, Will. Enough. Enough. It's, 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 well, let's just say there was not a price tag on the item. I had to ask, uh, and you know what they say about if you have to ask? You'll never know. It, well, no, it's just that, you know, if you got to ask, you probably can't afford it. Oh, well, that's, yeah, that's, 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 that's how us high That's how us high rollers will operate. Mm, I certainly wouldn't know about that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, every once in a while, it's good to follow you on social because you come, you come up with one of these, one of these wild, wild, uh, outfits or purchases or something that just completely <laughs> sideswipes me and it's uh, that's it's the clout you've been sideswiped by clout will you're clout chasing as they say yeah you know in a, in a way i think we're all we're all clout chasing lucas mancini <laughs> we just don't know it i i'm i'm just the puppet that can see the strings uh so yeah happy to have you with us for this episode of elwood city limits and as always we uh are going to be venturing into the ECL mailbag over at Elwood City Limits at gmail.com for a couple of correspondences. We have a quick one here from Frosted Blakes, who has a question about Crown City. On the show, Crown City is a parody of New York City, but in the episode Postcards from Buster, they visit New York City. So are there two New York adjacent cities in Arthur? I might be overthinking this. Thoughts? I think it's like the DC style, how there's like a metropolis and Gotham, but then also New York. Mm. So uh, yeah, Crown City, and and we don't actually know what state Crown City is in. It mm. could possibly be in the same state as Elwood City. I can't remember. They don't get it on a plane, right? They drive there. Uh, no, they do take a plane. Oh, they do take a plane. Mm-hmm. Okay, well then it's probably a couple states over. Um, but yeah, we don't know if Crown City's in New York State. I assume it's on the East Coast. Uh, but yeah, that's what I think it is. It's like it's like how in DC there's a mix of fake cities and real ones. Mm-hmm. I think that that that's a that's a good one. I I feel like that's probably the most likely. My thought is that is kind of pulling back a little bit even from that. It's um, that I would not. I'm not even sure. I'm not confident if Postcards from Buster is even really canon. So Whoa. that's I, I would say it's maybe side canon. Like I wouldn't I wouldn't commit they, to that. They've, entire they've show. gone to New York in other episodes though. Remember when they go to Carnegie Hall? Oh yeah, that's true. Hmm. Okay. Maybe I'm completely wrong. See, that's why there's two people on this podcast. <laughs> so I can't get away with saying stuff like that. <laughs> Uh, and we also have one here from Hannah, who's a new listener. Hi, guys. I've been meaning to write in for quite some time now. Finally getting around to it. Found the podcast a few months back. It's been my saving grace getting through the day at my desk job. Oh, I know that feeling. <clears throat> 
Arthur has been a part of You're my allergic life. Allergic to desk jobs, Will. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Arthur has been a part of my life since I was very little, and I can always look back on it as being one of my favorite parts of my childhood. I love it so much that I actually got a tattoo of Arthur a few months ago, which is shared Whoa. with you guys on Twitter, and plan on getting a matching DW sometime soon. Hannah, you sh- could you send that? T- you can either DM it to us or just tag us again. I vaguely remember you doing that, but I'd like to retweet that. Get t- speaking of clout pass it around we just passed 400 followers on our twitter so now we've got a few more eyes on the prize there the show has always been there for me in times of major anxiety and your podcast is just as comforting i wanted to mention as a major film geek i really appreciate and get a kick out of you and lucas's film references sprinkled throughout the show who are your favorite directors of all time i really love stanley kubrick and paul thomas anderson also which directors do you think the arthur gang would like the most as adults i think binky would be a huge michael bay fan Arthur strikes me as someone who would love Wes Anderson, and I think Sue Ellen would be really into Bong Joon-ho. Would love to know your guys' thoughts. Uh, once again, love the podcast. So happy I found a community of people who get just as excited about Arthur as I do. So that's from Hannah. So we've got a couple things to think about here. First of all, Lucas, favorite directors. Oh my gosh, that's really hard. Um... Well, if it helps, I recent I ran across a... Uh, a Twitter oh, meme today. Oh, yeah, I, I replied on that, the one where it's like, these directors get to stay, these directors have to go. Correct. Um, I would say, um, it's such a cop-out. Like, I feel like I want to say something cool and, and, and underground in a, in a, in a non-sort of easy answer, but it's got to mm. be, like, Kubrick, right? Like, <laughs> for me at least, I, I, I think that um, if you, you were to take someone's entire canon into account, I would say probably all time is Kubrick. Um, recently, I've been trying to make my way through all the uh, uh, Friedkin movies. So I, I was mm. watching uh, To Live or Die in L.A. and uh, uh, Sorcerer and, and of course, uh, The Exorcist and, and The French Connection. And so I've been on a, on a Friedkin kick lately as, as far as American directors are, are concerned. Friedkin's, um, a, Friedkin's a funny dude, isn't he? Like, have you oh seen... Oh, my gosh. That one interview with... with yeah, yeah, the one interview with him, um, and what's his name? The guy that made the, Drive. Nicholas uh, Winding Refn? Yeah, Nicholas Winding Refn, and Nicholas Refn's like, yeah, I think Drive is, like, entered the canon of, like, the all-time great movies. And Freakin, like, keeps gesturing off-camera to be like, can we get a medic in here? Yeah. Can we get a doctor? <laughs> <laughs> I'm interested, um, I would really like to see, I've always wanted to see Bug. Apparently, Bug, William William Friedkin's mm. movie in the 2000s is really good. I mean, I could stand to see a lot more of his stuff, so don't get me wrong. That's what about actually you, Will? That, that's a really favorite, good favorite director. So, unfortunately, the meme has been deleted. My tweet hasn't. Um, I did do my own kind of passing through of the Coen Brothers, which was a great, which was a grand old time. And I kind of surprised myself when I was looking through this di- list of directors. So basically, it was a Twitter meme of like, yeah, like Lucas said, three got to go. And it's all of the major ones. It's your Scorsese's, who used to be my favorite director. He's my, fav- he my favorite director in university when I was studying film minor because I was a... Uh, I was young. I was a young white male who was also used to be Catholic. I just did. I was like Scorsese without the coke and without the you know talent for making films. So love love Scorsese to a degree. I was surprised that one of my picks was David Lynch. There was a time where I was really um, opposed. Not maybe not opposed, but I kind of was like aggressively didn't understand David Lynch and kind of refused to. But ever since I like watched Twin Peaks and watch Twin Peaks The Return, and kind of got more into his filmography, I find I I enjoy his presence in film more than I used to. And another one of mine was Denis Villeneuve, who that's somebody that I really want to do a filmography watch of. He's got some really amazing films, and his, he's got Arrival, he's got Blade Runner 2049, He's a director of Dune coming up, which is one of yeah, the biggest excited draws. For Dune. Excited for Dune, big time. Um, another favorite director of mine since I recently watched two of his bigger movies is uh, Frank Darabont. I really like Frank Darabont. He did The Shawshank Redemption, The Green Mile, both of which I watched recently and which are really fantastic. And one of my favorite horror movies, The Mist. Uh, oh, so I'm a huge, the, huge... The, the new Mist? The the one from 2009 oh, or whenever that was. Oh, interesting. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that he that was him. Yeah. So I really like him and yeah that's kind of, that's kind of where i'm at with those and then there are usually i'm very like oh i like a couple from this one a couple from this one it's 
very rare. I mean, I'm also a big big Edgar Wright guy. There's, uh, there's uh, for mm-hmm. me, Edgar Wright has rarely missed, uh, and I'm looking forward to his next thing. But there was also like when I was thinking of like top three. You know, the thing that kind of disqualified Edgar Wright for me is that he's a little bit, like kind of like Tarantino was in the 90s, he can be a bit derivative, but, mm-hmm. uh, I, and I think that that usually works in concert with the style that he has, but uh, yeah, no, I'm, I think it's, again, it's a very like uh, white, col- white college boy opinion to be like, my favorite director is Edgar Wright, but yeah. no, it is true to a degree. I understand Lucas trying to avoid the, the obvious picks. It's true. Like, the older I get, the more, and it's still, you know, it's funny we say trying to avoid the obvious picks and then listen to what I'm about to say. Um, the older I get, the more I, I try to watch a little bit more, for lack of a better term, world cinema. Mm-hmm. So, like, I, I've been trying to watch, like, less uh, American-centric directors. So, you know, trying to watch our Tartofskis and our Godards and your your Fassbinders and your, your Fellinis and your Kurosawas and, and stuff like that. So, trying to get a little bit outside of, of the box what with the making use of the the criterion channel and all that stuff Mm -hmm. but i don't think as much as i've and oh and bergman too um and as much as i've i've loved 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 kind of many of the movies i've seen from those directors uh i don't think i've seen like enough of their canon uh to, to call any one of them my favorite um whereas you know kubrick i've seen like pretty much every kubrick movie with with a handful of exceptions and i i think they're kind of as close to perfect as some movies can get um, when it comes to like, it's so funny cause like I have favorite movies. Like for me, it's not, we've talked about this before, you know, my favorite movies are pretty clear in my mind, like Gremlins too, but I'm not going to say Joe Dante is my favorite director, right? Cause yeah. it's kind of a different thing. Similarly with like Heat, I love Heat. Um, but I certainly don't love every Michael Mann movie. Yeah. Uh, so, so it's, it's, it's tough for me. So if I have to like, yeah, pick, pick, uh, uh, a director, I would say, and then if we're talking about that kind of th- eliminate three directors or, or pick three directors to save thing for me um the other the other two i said besides kubrick were of that list i think that's that's you know again pretty american-centric list that is oh very. Uh, uh but um of that list I, I think i said carpenter and that's like that's just like a personal choice because it's just um you know he's carpenter's one of the masters uh and then um um yeah so i don't know maybe verhoven uh, I rewatched mm. RoboCop this year, mm. and I was like amazed by like how perfect and unchangeable that movie is. Like how there's not like a single flaw or error in that entire movie. It's just like a completely fully formed idea. Um, and so yep. Ver- Verhoeven is is really fun as well. But I don't know. Yeah, it's I don't really have a favorite director. I have favorite movies, but not really favorite directors. For the Ver- kids, this is I want to get into the kids. We this is a listen. We both like movies, so this is uh, we're giving this email a little bit more time than we usually do. Uh, I, I would love to like hear your thoughts. I think that Arthur, um, you know, Arthur's kind of like an everyman kind of guy, right? So mm. I feel like Arthur would be into like Ron Howard or like Spielberg. Spielberg, um, yes, yeah. And the then pow- I think the power of storytelling and all that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, I, I think Brain would love Christopher Nolan, especially like his yes. new stuff, like Interstellar and and Tenant. Brain would have a field day with. Um, uh, maybe whoever directed did did Ron Howard do The Martian? Who did The Martian? Anyway, uh, I brain, think that, brain would brain yeah, would no, like I that think, movie. I, th- I, think, I think it was Ron Howard. I want to say yes. Um, um, yeah, no, th- those are those are some good ones so far. I think I think Buster would be a big Edgar Wright guy. Uh, oh yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Or or uh, Fincher. You know, I could see Buster getting into like Fight Club and stuff. Yeah, it's a, I, I feel uh, like it's a little dark for Buster, but maybe it could. You be. know, he loves a good mystery, so he could be solving the the Zodiac Killer stuff. By the way, if we get to Fern, I got one that I, I'm going to blow your socks off with Fern. <laughs> uh, I think Fern would be into Sofia Coppola. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, the 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 I, I think Fern's unique type of melancholy works with things like The Virgin Suicides or yes. Lost in Translation. Um. I think, of course, Sue Ellen would be into. She's so worldly. I, I, I think Sue Ellen would be into like. Um, what's the guy that made the Holy Mountain? Jodorowsky. Oh, uh, d- uh, yeah, Jodorowsky. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what that's what Sue Ellen would be about. Um, hmm. I think the brain might also like get into Jim Jarmusch. I can maybe see him getting into Jarmusch. Is his brain listen to the Wu Tang Clan? <laughs> uh, yeah, you never know. And then I, I think that's selling uh, Binky Short saying that Binky would be into uh, Michael Bay. 
uh, I think you know, Binky. Let's let's. Binky's got that soft side, and I don't, th- is, I don't what, think it's. I don't, oh, I, don't I think got it's it. Out I got of the it. question. You I got, got it. it. What? What are Binky's two big interests? The clarinet. The clarinet. Ballet, and yes. Professional wrestling. I think Binky's watching Darren Aronofsky movies. <laughs> mm, yes, could be, could be. Again, uh, a well, bit, uh, we don't a know bit, if he gets into black tar heroin later on, but who knows? <laughs> um, I think D- I think DW grows up to be a, like a like a Disney a Disney wife. You know what I mean? Oh goodness gracious! Or maybe she's into like uh, D- D- DW is one of those people like begging to see the Snyder cut. Uh, okay, no, 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 thing. no, no! Come on, don't, don't do her like that. I'm just saying she, she's she either... loves sucker punch. No, stop it! <laughs> no, she's either. I, I think she's either, you know, sunny and cuddly, or she's into like the real edgy stuff. Like it's one way, it's one way or the other. Oh no, she's into um. Oh, who made Green Inferno? Ugh. Uh, oh, not uh, Eli Roth. Sorry, Eli not... Roth. <laughs> No, she, but she's like into Takashi Miike and stuff like that. Oh, okay. Ooh, and I bet uh, Suellen, um, another one for Suellen would be Dario Argento. I could see, she likes mm-hmm. like spooky stuff. She likes like, remember the Halloween episode? I feel like like yeah. Suellen would be into Argento. Francine's um, really into 30, 30 for 30. Uh, Francine would be into, for some reason, yeah, like Oliver Stone. <laughs> I feel like that's the kind of vibe I get out of Francine. Like Oliver Stone did any given Sunday, right? Football's yes. like like if it's yeah, a I game of inches. I, yeah, oh I yeah, so. I think Francine would totally be into like Oliver Stone, like Born on the Fourth of July, JFK, Natural Born Killers. I get an Oliver Stone vibe from Francine for some reason. Muffy uh, Muffy loves James Cameron because she loves the most filmmaking. Yeah, Muffy either likes James Cameron or maybe Muffy likes you know late stage Scorsese. Uh, there's like a meme on mm. TikTok that dudes who are econ majors are like obsessed with the Wolf of Wall Street. Oh, yeah. Um, so I could see I could see Muffy being into that. Uh. Yeah, is there anybody else? This is fun. I could do this all day. Um, what about what about um, what about George? Uh, George is actually you don't wouldn't expect this, but hardcore Cronenberg fan. George loves the yeah, body horror. Yeah, you know, you know, I, I I bet he's also into Carpenter for like the special effects. Oh yeah, like as uh, he's a, he's a puppeteer, or maybe George is a man after my own heart. You know, likes Joe Dante. Likes he's a like anyone with taste uh, will. George is a fan of the film Gremlins 2, The New Batch. I think maybe when he grows up, George has like a Fangoria subscription. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Shudder or whatever it's called. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, the, I think that the, I think we've uh, worked out some pretty good prototypes here. So uh, hopefully uh, that was uh, satisfying, uh, at least in terms of that question. Uh, thank you, everybody, for sending your emails in to uh, ElwoodCityLimits at gmail.com. Thank you, uh, Blake. Thank you, Hannah. And, of course, we are saying a, a, a big thank you. We have even more patrons this week who have just signed up to take advantage of uh, of exclusive content over patreon.com slash Limits. So let's welcome in people like Allison Archambeau, Jeffrey Gao, and Hannah Kitten. We also have uh, true blue patrons such as Mary Archambeau. Hmm... I wonder if that runs the family. Alistair, we have Valeria and Nicholas DeMarco, Lawrence Mason Bishop, Daniel Updegraff, Joe Low Flo, Ursula Cat, Michelle Sprzinski, Owen, Lee Goldson, Lion Dog ZXA, EJ Acra, Christine Lescody, Greg Hagai, Yoshi, Lily W, Melissa Avales, Andrew Power, Matt, Pretty Cool Stairs, Marlo Stanfield, Rachel Pearson, Michaela Gibson, Kristen, Sierra S, Cat, Aaron DeFilippo, William, Shayna Bennett, Caitlin Harrington, Kaylin Krogall, Kevin Noon, Jake Bailey, Macy Ball, Riley Stevens, Joe Sue, Christine Wong, Stella, Froppy, Emily Kay, Shander LaFave Boten, uh, we have John Griswold, Teresa, Dan Mike Dawson Silva, Light Relentless, Ian Collis, John Dulong, and Leanne S. Uh, also, patrons, if y- um, so please make sure to check your Patreon inbox. You may have received a message from me from the Elwood City Limits Patreon account asking you for a piece of information. Now, I just need a response one way or the other. If you prefer not to say... That's okay. Please respond anyway and let me know. If you can give me that piece of information, please send that to me ASAP. And if you didn't receive anything, if you're one of our newer patrons, don't worry about it. Okay, so now we're getting into this Arthur episode. Lucas, it's a Binky episode. Binky versus Binky. 
Binky versus Binky. So we join Binky uh, in trying to uh, gain custody of uh, Binky's son. Um, and also his first name's his last name now, so his partner is also named Binky. Um, and yeah, they're just in this really hard-fought custody battle. Um, you know, it's a kind of like a 70s like drama. No, well, unfortunately... It's not an authorized version of Kramer versus Kramer. Uh, it's instead of being about two Binkies, it's actually about Binky and himself. There's only one Binky man, and there's only one of this shirt that he's rocking. Oh yeah, as he, oh yeah. As he opens the the door to his room, or I should say, the door to his room is opened, and Binky is uh, in mid change. So if, he gets. If, this... if we were ever doing a uh, time like episode start to drip challenge. Uh, I think this episode takes the cake because immediately, immediately, Binky's bringing the drip. He opens up the door. He's wearing this pink and purple polka dot shirt. Um, and at, it's not in initially clear, like, what the shirt is or represents. I My assumption was it reminded me of, like, 90s uh, soccer or football uh, jerseys. <laughs> if you ever look at those, like, 90s, like, umbro um mm. jerseys they're they're making a little bit of a comeback in the like instagram vintage fashion world everybody loves those like 90s football jerseys really? so uh that's what this reminded me of was like because some of them could get pretty pretty wild with the patterns and stuff um yeah okay uh, i'll have to take your word for that again you are on the forefront of fashion as far <laughs> oh as this two-man affair is concerned so i bow to your wisdom in in this so binky is talking about how sometimes people have something that you cannot replace so for example we cut to binky with brain and brain has his blues records that he cherishes such as uh, a record called it's the blues man by an artist named sad shoehead wilson this continues to be my favorite thing they do, like the least, both the least annoying and my favorite thing they do with the brain character is his love of blues music. Yeah, you like um, that? Yeah, well, yeah, I I always love it when like, um, for instance, like brain is like, of course, this like super sciencey like intellectual. Um, I think it would be a less interesting choice to be like, oh yeah, brain listens to IDM. He's just like a big Aphex Twin fan. Yeah. Um, I always like it when someone kind of has a certain aesthetic or a certain vibe, but then you're kind of surprised by the type of music they're into. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, th I, I agree. It's, it's, a, it's a little touch to the character that almost feels personal and uh, helps kind of make them feel a little bit more fleshed out. Uh, Buster has the remnants of a pizza crust of a pizza he ate called the White Wonder, which was apparently five feet like in either direction, so an, an enormous pizza they have to cart out, and it's covered with mozzarella and ricotta cheese. And the only thing that I could think was the ensuing trip to the bathroom mm, that the mm, White Wonder mm. would inspire. Yeah, I hope Buster's taking his Metamucil. Um, Metamucil I, uh... and like uh, what and his lactate. Yeah, or yeah. Not as, not, not as like what's this? What's the thing that uh, people have to take when they're? Uh, oh no, that's when, lactate. When, is it? Is it lactate? Yeah, yeah. I know. I okay. know that that's also a adjective, but uh, I I believe the well, product. To, well, to lactate, but then there's I think yeah. there's lactate. Lactate. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Lactate is for when you have a uh, you're lactose intolerant and you need to eat a bunch of cheese. Like although, uh, although, Buster's. Although, after having that much matzah, you might be lactating. <laughs> oh my goodness gracious. Um, well, that's one Google search I'm not going to do, which is Please Buster don't. lactating. <laughs> uh, but I'll also say that I love the continuity of Buster's disgust. Okay, just like how uh, <laughs> Brain's uh, love of blues music is one of my favorite aspects of his character, one of the most repulsive aspects of Buster's character, a character I normally really like, is his weirdo like glass case that he keeps all that disgusting, like rotten food in, um, mm. it, like it's it doesn't come across as nasty in an animated show because we can't really see the detail of the amount of like mold and just kind of what kind of cultures and uh, what kind of biosphere is going on inside that cabinet. But there's like been food stuffs in there that have been around for about as long as as buster's been eating so i can only imagine just that the foul smell emanating from that case every time he opens it that being said i'm glad that they're um you know keeping the continuity and they they keep going back to that joke <laughs> me too uh so binky apparently has something that he can't replace but he's not exact i does he i think he mentions that it's a shirt but we don't exactly know why not yet at least the actual episode starts with a soccer uh, soccer game 
where they're up against Mighty Mountain, of course. And Francine has a strategy that she's going to put Binky, who is normally a defenseman, in front of her as she goes for a goal. Because that way, Binky will be able to intimidate. He'll be, essentially be able to goon uh, the other Mighty Mountain players who are physically bigger than the Lakewood players. And it seems to work okay, but Binky gets an opportunity to kick the ball into the goal, and then all of a sudden, his ghost, like, psychs him out. Like, this was weird to see at least the first time, and he essentially kind of gets performance anxiety here. The the ghost is very, is, like, comes out of his body, and it's like, ah, you're gonna miss the shot, you're gonna mess this up, and so Binky's like, no, it's like, no, I've gotta, I've gotta shoot it now, and everybody's yelling at him to shoot the ball, but eventually he like literally just like just kicked the ball, but he kicks it back to Francine and Mighty Mountain takes advantage and they end up winning the game. I love the uh, delivery from evil ghost Binky. Uh, like he definitely like puts a little something, a little extra in his voice to denote that like this Binky is not uh, Binky's true thoughts. This is like a manifestation of Binky's imagination. And it really comes through like his delivery is a little bit different than Binky's regu- regular delivery. Uh, uh, there's a little bit something more sinister to it. Uh, so I like that. This is this actually becomes the through line for the episode. So Francine says that this is actually a character, uh, a, fl- a flaw in Binky's character, where he is, you know, he's very good at a lot of sports, but then when it comes down to competition, he just ends up free, like freezing up or essentially just messing up and not being able to compete. So whether it's in Little League Baseball, whether it's in soccer, like we saw, you know, he's a strong swimmer, but when he goes to a swim meet, he, like, doesn't even get in the water. So there's it, it's all about how Binky has performance anxiety, which I found interesting on his face. I wanted to see kind of where they were going with this. It's true. I thought it was interesting, too, Will. And I don't know, I can't speak for you, but in my experience... Um, I avoided this problem by not playing competitive sports. <laughs> well, and well, and similarly to you, I kind of stray away from competition too because I also, I mean, if you've been listening to the show for a long time, you know that I have anxiety in spades, and one of which is performance anxiety. Like it actually kind of, I kind of realized I had it. I mean, early on when I played soccer as a young kid, like I really like free. I, I very much like in the way Binky does freeze up. Uh, in competitions, uh, it actually comes out a lot of times when somebody's watching me play a video game. I uh, I actually get I have to be like, oh, I don't want to mess this up. I don't want to mess this up. And, and of course, in that thinking, I do. So I understand where this comes from. And it was very interesting to see. And that that's why I don't like I don't enjoy playing like competitive multiplayer games or anything like that. Unless I'm like, you know, it's all for fun. I've only entered a video game competition once or twice, and I did not do very well. So I completely related to where this was coming from. And we also get a little thing here where Binky is... We get a bit of Binky and his mom, where his mom finds this old trophy of his from a swim meet, but then she wants to uh, put it on the mantle. And Binky's very embarrassed. He doesn't want this because it's a participation trophy. Oh, now this, so you're telling me Binky's a snowflake millennial? Well, this was this <laughs> this. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not saying no. I'm not saying yes. <laughs> Read into it how you want to. That's the beauty of Arthur. But I would. This was where I was like, okay, I could see two paths where this episode could go, and I was like, all right, I hope it goes the right way, because Binky is very much like I didn't earn this. It doesn't mean anything, and his mom is like, no, but it. It's like, but you're such a good swimmer, and I want this to be up here because I'm proud of you. And as somebody who once had a participation trophy for soccer, like, I kind of get it. Even though I was I was very happy to get my participation award because I don't normally get awards for athletic uh, competition. So I was, I was happy to get my participation award. Speaking of this mantle, I'm, I got it paused at 5.30 right now. Yeah. Um, and there's the, all of these kind of participation awards Binky has been granted. And some of them I'm, like, really curious about. Like, like there's one that just looks like a bust of Pickles the Clown. Well, um, and th- this is in the dream sequence that Binky has. Oh, okay, okay, okay. It was hard to tell with the sound off. Okay, so these, these so Binky does not actually have, for instance, an award that looks like an Oscar, but instead it's Binky. Well, yes, because Binky has this dream where his anxiety 
of having this participation trophy comes from the fact that his mom is essentially like embarrassing him because he's got all of these like oh and here's an award where Binky wasn't actually in this contest but he was close to it so it they the, gave him a trophy yeah that was the potato he got from being near a potato race that's it and then the one that looks like an Oscar is Binky like and this is for being the best Binky possible and we get a good Francine line where here just like who would want it <laughs> <laughs> there's there's a really hey like, that one's impressive he beat out the band <laughs> Oh, good point. I didn't even think about that. Um, I liked how acid-tipped the portrayal of participation trophies is. Now, of course, as Lucas, you alluded to, this is something that is has been in the past leveled at kind of our generation of, you know, growing up with participation trophies and everybody's a winner and this kind of thing. So I felt that coming out a little bit where they're allowed to be a little bit mean about how participation trophies can affect kids or at least... in. It is at least in the context of this is a dream in which Binky's anxieties are at the forefront. So this is how he sees it. I don't think the show is communicating that participation trophies are wholly bad. But there is a little bit of venom behind, like, I am imagine that uh, the, the writers of this episode maybe have kids that have dealt with this situation before. Mm. So, yeah, Binky doesn't want to be looked at as just, like, you know, getting a trophy just basically for existing. So he intends to throw he intends to throw it out. It's like a, what it is, it's like a dolphin breaching. It's like this. It's like a silver trophy of a dolphin breaching. But he doesn't want to throw it out in his garbage because he doesn't want it to get discovered. So he takes his bicycle all the way to the dump. And on the way there, he powers up. A hill on his bicycle. He even switches speeds. We get a little animation of him switching speeds, and he passes by Oliver Frensky, who I was who, all too happy to see. Yeah, and, I, and we're not used to seeing Oliver Frensky in this scenario where he's like hapless and like he's like, oh my gosh, Biggie's so fast. <laughs> like he's just like trying to chug up this hill. It, it was a really uh, unique role to see him in. We usually just see him as like in full on dad mode. Uh, or as, you know, full-on sanitation worker mode. But it was nice to see, like, he's out here exercising, and he's just kind of bewildered at kind of uh, Binky's physical power-ass. Well, that's the thing, is is that it's communicated that Binky is, like, a multi-sport athlete and really, really good. It's just when it comes to competition, which is where he falters. Otherwise... If, if, If Binky could get over his anxiety, he'd be like Bo Jackson. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because uh, he's able to power up this hill, presumably because he's got a he's got a long gas tank and because he's got powerful limbs. So he uh, Oliver eventually catches up to him and be like, "Wow, that was amazing!" And Biggie's like, "Yeah, I like doing hills." And Oliver's just like, "You you actually like biking up hills?" Which again, I'm not a I'm not a cyclist, but to me that seems like maybe the worst part of cycling. So this is where. Oliver Frensky makes mention of the cyclist Vance Legstrong. And I, I think I audibly went, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wh- when did this episode come out, Will? 2006, I want to say. Ooh, well, before, okay. b- Long before The Troubles. Yeah, I just got to do a quick Google search. Uh, Lance... Armstrong this, Lance Armstrong's- controversy. It would have been in, like, 2012. I remember I was in 2013. I was in, I was in like community college when it happened. 2013. Did you ever see that movie, The Program? Mm, no, I don't think so. About about Lance Armstrong and all that stuff. My dad was a huge Lance Armstrong guy. Like my oh, dad stupid. loved Lance Armstrong because my dad's like really fit. He likes to mountain bike and he he he. But he's like a short guy like me, so he's like a fit short guy. So he always like right. really looked up to Lance Armstrong and he liked Lance Armstrong. And he, I think he was into his story of like overcoming cancer and coming back and and um the you know he was rocking the Live Strong bracelets that used to be everywhere. Yeah, uh, and so I think, I think he I was, had one one point. He was extra. Uh, he take he took it extra hard. Lance Armstrong sort of fall from grace. Uh, he was pretty, pretty disappointed in all that. Uh, so I, I, I was like, oh, this is like a Lance Armstrong, uh, not parody, but like they obviously couldn't get him to do a guest voice or did they will? Cause they, they the, didn't No, Vance Le- Legstrong however, does speak at the end of the episode. However, oh. to be continued with Lance Armstrong on Arthur. Oh my goodness gracious. And that's all I'll say. We'll get to it when we get to it, but to be continued. 
Uh, so yeah, Binky discovers who Vance Legstrong is, and the, he he's even like, yeah, he rode the Loop d'Italia, which I think is probably a takeoff on the Tour de France. Great fake race name. The Loop d'Italia. Uh, so Binky is kind of using him as a bit of a role model and thinking that maybe he could get into cycling a bit more. But we get a bit of dialogue here, again, with his ghost, which is meant to represent his performance anxiety and his anxiety in general, which I thought was a, a really... A really cool way to do it. I mean, we've tackled anxiety a lot with Arthur, so it was kind of strange to see it from another character. But his Binky's inner self, I think, is actually a really great way to repre- represent both anxiety and poor self-image. It feels very true to life of like the types of, and speaking from experience, the type of conversation that you'll have in your head as to like why you can't do something. There's a uh, a meme I'm really fond of, and it's like the nine types of storytelling, but they use like wrestling pictures to convey each one. So you know, like man versus nature, man oh, yeah. versus man, man versus self, man versus God, and it's like all these like different like wrestling pictures. Like for man versus God, it's like the time Vince McMahon wrestled God and all this. Stuff. <laughs> oh yes, I think I've seen uh, this. Yeah, uh, but like I feel like you could really easily do one of those with like screen caps from Arthur out of context. Totally. Um, like it'd be so easy to find like man versus nature. Like for, for instance, use that like uh uh the the goose episode where they all go camping and they're gonna get attacked by a bear or or there's like numerous examples uh but this would be perfect for man versus self is this screen cap of of binky and then like his ghost version kind of accosting him you're right it would be i didn't even that's that's a really good point um yeah so binky is there's like a there's a bi- there's a bicycle course nearby, and Binky decides that he's going to go all in to cycling. And he even, like, is the fastest cyclist on the route on the day that he decides to go there. And he's having a really good time getting into cycling, to the point where Francine and, Francine and Oliver ask him if he's going to enter into the annual Spokes for Regular Folks Road Challenge, which is kind of, which is a, which is a bicycle race. But Binky is not so sure. He doesn't, he doesn't think that he can do it. Thankfully... He gets some encouraging words from the poster of Vance Legstrong. This is like when uh, Bruce Springsteen talks to uh, John Cusack's character in High Fidelity. Uh... <laughs> Something like that, although unfortunately not not nearly as cool as that as, as the, the boss. boss. Oh no, few no. P- few people are, let alone you know disgraced uh, cyclist Lance Armstrong. <laughs> Hey, Vance Legstrong. He's legally he's That's legally true. distinct. That's true. Le- Vance Legstrong, you know, never had a doping scandal, as far as we know. Uh, so I wonder decide- if Vance Legstrong still has both testicles. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that's not for us to know. <laughs> Uh, so Binky decides to buck up and he does enter the contest or the race, I should say. So he's doing really well at first. And, uh, we, we, there's a little in joke here. I forgot to mention, there's a joke where the people at the very beginning of the soccer game, everybody was wondering why Binky didn't kick and Buster thought it was because he fell asleep standing up with his, with his leg up and, Everybody's like, well, that's ridiculous. And Buster's like, I don't know, I'm falling asleep in some weird positions. And then he's like, falls asleep. Stand- Buster literally falls asleep standing up. So Arthur, Buster, and Brain are like watching Binky over binoculars. And Buster's like, careful, Binky, don't fall asleep. Yeah. The, it, I think earlier when uh, Binky's got one leg up in the air, someone goes, he looks like a flamingo. <laughs> uh, so Binky's doing really well on, he's like the first in the race. And then all of a sudden he takes a tumble into some bushes and he thinks that that's that like, he, he's like he kind of starts dooming a little bit about it. Just like, Oh no, this is it. Like I messed it up. But the mess, but the message that the apparition of Vance Legstrong gave to him is that when you're in a competition setting, it's not about, it's not about challenging or beating the people who are in the competition with you. The only person that you should be competing with is yourself. So Binky takes that to heart and he decides to keep going with the race, even though he's not in first place anymore. And despite his deficit of like falling into the bush, he manages to finish the race and not in last place. So still pretty good, even if it's not first place. And this is where Binky gets his polka dot his polka dotted hill climbing jersey, which is one of the awards given out to uh, somebody, I think, person who went up the hill the fastest or something like that. Something yeah. to that effect? 
I, and I, I mean, those like I don't know if you've seen like cyclists on the road or something, but the people who have like the whole, the whole gear, right? Like they got that little hat with the beak that goes upwards. They got the tiny shorts and they got the, yeah. like, the skin tight zip ups. They all mm-hmm. are, are usually pretty crazy colors and patterns and stuff. So once it was revealed that that's what that shirt was, well, once I saw uh, Vance Legstrong wearing it, it, it became more clear to me uh, what that shirt was. And that's where Binky caps off the episode. The rare kind of cold open that goes into the end of the episode where he says how much he loves this shirt and how much it means to him and he would never give it up for anything. So that's where that kind of came from. And that's kind of it. Binky's arc was very quick in this episode. Like I was surprised when it was like, oh, oh, we're we're already there. Oh, my goodness. So it felt like it ended very quickly. Uh, but we have another ep- we have another story to go here in the Arthur world, so stay tuned for just a moment. We will be right back. This podcast is supported by listeners like you, and here's how. Over on our social networks, you can follow us and find the latest updates and some fun photos. Facebook.com slash Elwood City Limits, at ECL Podcast on Twitter, ElwoodCityLimits.tumblr.com, and Elwood City Limits on Instagram. You can support us monetarily by going over to patreon.com slash Elwood City Limits. If you become a patron for as little as a dollar a month, you get access to exclusive audio content like our new PBS Kids show, movie reviews, and sneak previews of upcoming content. Support us as well by going to teespring.com slash stores slash Elwood dash city dash limits dash store or search Elwood City Limits on Teespring. Buy yourself a t-shirt, a tank top, or a hoodie with the Elwood City Limits logo or an exclusive design by our friend Josh. Elwood City Limits is available online at libsyn.com slash Elwood City Limits where you can find it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and other podcast apps. Is it not on your favorite app? Let us know. And you can always help us by spreading the word, tell your friends, and send Send us a message either on social media or an email, elwoodcitylimits at gmail.com. Thank you so much for your continued support. And now, let's get back to the show. Lucas, some things aren't as bad as they seem as long as you're prepared. That's how we begin Operation DW. Yeah, which is kind of a weird, considering where this episode goes, it's kind of a a weird kind of intro. Because I don't necessarily agree with the show that that's what the moral of this episode is. But whatever. We we see Bionic Bunny facing off against what seems to be Godzilla. Gojira himself. Yes, uh, some, something to that degree. And, and it's Arthur kind of telling us, yeah, these things, if you're prepared, it's not a big deal. Uh, we then cut to, and I really enjoyed this, it got me missing the, with all this talk of races, bike races, and then this little sequence, I was like, oh, remember how fun those those boxcar episodes were with, with Buster and Arthur building the boxcar? Uh, totally. We, we see the boxcar return, um, Buster and Arthur are on some sort of like, uh, it reminded me of like Cruise in USA, like <laughs> they're, they're driving through the jungle in a boxcar, uh, very precarious situation, uh, but it Buster's makes me, keeping it, it cool. It makes me think of Diddy Kong Racing, switching oh between, goodness. because Buster turns his go-kart into a boat. Yeah, so legendary, Kong... legendary title, Diddy Kong Racing. Amazing game. So it didn't go It didn't go to a hovercraft, but it did turn into a boat so that they could keep going. I, I also wanted to know, Bionic Bunny saves the day from Godzilla, or Schmodzilla in this point, uh, to using his Monster Shrinker Vader, which is just a shrink ray on a gun. And then Arthur says, sometimes there are things that you can't really prepare for, such as... (laughs) Such as his mom and dad's haircut. Oh my gosh. Check this out. This is crazy. So Arthur's mom has a perm, first and foremost. Mm -hmm. She's like Mm -hmm. crimped her hair. Like, to look like Sarah Jessica Parker in, in the Sex of the City or something. And then we go from the crimp to the quaff. Look at what Arthur's dad is rocking. I don't even know what hairstyle this is. It's crazy. It looks almost like feathered hair. Like a, like almost a little bit of, like, the flock of seagulls. It's standing up so high. I know. It's it's really just a wild... Both of them look so young here. They um, look like kids. Yeah. And Arthur's dad especially looks... So is the implication that Arthur's dad is bald? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, he must be he must be balding. Cuz with the male characters, like they often don't have hair, right? Like mm-hmm. Buster doesn't yeah. have hair, uh Brain doesn't have hair. They just have like fur. Uh but to now see with like Arthur's dad with this crazy like it almost looks like a toupee. Um I guess the implication is that Arthur's dad uh lost all his hair. 
<laughs> raising DW from zero to four years old <laughs> was one hell of a job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't even think about how that implies that Arthur's dad used to have hair, but of course we saw him in previous pictures with like a mustache and a big and big hairdo. So it's just like this would have been them in like their early to mid thirties, so not far off far off from where I am. This is they look. It's amazing how much younger they look with just longer or just having hair at all. And of course, baby baby DW and little Arthur are always very cute. Um. So this baby, is another... baby DW, by the way, full head of speaking of hair, yeah, that's full, right, full head of hair as a fresh newborn. She has like a bob, which <laughs> I'm glad you noticed that because I totally didn't. But you're right. Like even baby Kate doesn't have that much hair uh, when she when she kind of debuted in the show. But we I guess we had to know it was DW or else the audience might be confused. So Arthur. So this is a DW episode again, as we've been used to having in the second half of Arthur episodes. Uh, a lot of them in season 10, second half have been DW. So it seems that DW is having trouble, like literally having physical trouble listening. We get this uh, Miss Morgan calling everybody over to, to sit down in like a semicircle, but DW uh, apparently doesn't hear her. She uses the phrase, use your listening ears, which I've always, I understand it. But I, I always think it's a really strange saying. Yeah. Uh, just once I would love a preschooler to say, as opposed to what? <laughs> My yeah. not listening ears? <laughs> it's so prime for a comeback, but they're just too they're too small for comebacks. They they don't have the brain power for it yet. So Tommy has to literally go up and, and, and yell at DW, put your listening ears on, which I thought was pretty funny. Um DW also has to jack up the volume on Mary Moo Cow so she can hear. Um so that it can be heard everywhere in the house, but even though she can still barely hear it. And we even get a little thing here with dad being like, D- DW's like, um, I need to have it up all the way or I can't hear it. And dad's like, uh, yeah. It's, it's just one of those things of like, uh oh, this is going to turn into a thing. Well, she also she has to sit right next to the TV. And it's actually, this is funny. This reminded me of like when I was a kid. This is how we figured out I needed glasses, was I had trouble oh. seeing the board in grade two. And I would sit really close to the TV to see it. And that's how my parents determined that I needed glasses. So All, I, I, all from context clues. Yeah, a little bit less serious than kind of we learned DW situation is, but still kind of a similar revelation. Mm-hmm. So DW goes to visit <sighs> Dr. Tinnitus. Okay, so I'm glad that you introduced Dr. Tinnitus with the right kind of amount of... Uh, well, okay... Like, imagine you go to your doctor and it's like, hey, it's me, Dr. Lymphoma. <laughs> hey, it's Dr. Lupus here to help you. I'm like, uh, <laughs> could you change your name, please? <laughs> Hi, it's Dr. Erectile Dysfunction. Yeah, hey. You go to your therapist. Hello, it's me, Mr. Depression. <laughs> that sounded like Mario. That it's, was like, it's somebody, it's yeah. me, uh, Mr. Depression. Mr. Depression. <laughs> Depression PhD. Wahoo! <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. It's just like, I know that they like to do this sometimes, and it's just, it's just a little too cute. Tinnitus don't even sound like a name, Will. It, no. Ain't nobody named not. Tinnitus? Uh, no, definitely not. Well, I'm, well, okay, I wouldn't say definitely not, but like, come on, an ear doctor named Tinnitus. Let's just... Can we just, can we just, so we get a, we, I feel like this is a really great episode for doctors. The doctors in this episode are very kind and very polite. And we'll get into that a bit more as Dr. Oh, I hate saying it. Dr. Tinnitus has to look in DW's ears and sees that there's a blockage in them. We even get a handy little dream sequence where Dr. Tin. The doctor is explaining what is giving like a represent is explaining what happens when sound goes into your ear, which is funny because I literally just watched an episode of a kid's show named Ask the Storybots about how sound travels into your ear. Who on had Friday. a better, better explanation, the Storybots or, or uh, Arthur? The Storybots had the better explanation, but they also had the advantage because the whole episode was about how do like how does he how do ears work? Mm. Before uh, DW's dad pointed out that DW has had multiple ear infections, 
uh, in one year. At first, I was just like, does she just have a lot of earwax? Does she need to put those crazy candles? You ever see that? The candle thing? People put candles in their ears, and they light the ends of the wicks, and then they pull out a bunch of earwax. Sounds vaguely familiar, I guess. I've always wanted to have it done. I have some trouble hearing. I got a lot of wax in my ears, and I don't use Q-tips to clean them because ear doctors tell you not to do that. They say, don't put anything in your ear smaller than your elbow. So, you know, I don't do that, and so I just can't hear anybody at all the time. So mm-hmm. I've to think about doing that candle thing. It looks crazy, though, when you see someone get it done. They got two candles sticking out of their ears. You ever you ever get your ears flushed? No. Dude, you uh, have maybe. to get your ears flushed. Ma- maybe. I don't know. I, 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 I had an ear infection when I was really, really young, like single mm. digits young, and I don't remember much about it, but... Maybe I got so, my ears flushed then. So, so did I. I think that's pretty common for really young kids. But, like, and it's not even like, oh, you have to get it. It's just like, you won't believe how amazing it feels to hear after you get your ears flushed. I've had to do it maybe two or three times. And it's just so it's just, just so happened that I've had a blockage of earwax. And I'll try to keep this as non-explicit as possible. But basically, they just pour a bunch of solution into your ear and then drain it out. It looks disgusting, oh. but then you feel like a you feel like Superman because you can hear everything in such clarity. Sounds a I lot less I, uh, kind of can't. you know uh, flammable than because it's I, th- I think it accomplishes the very same thing as like the candle method. But I think uh, it sounds a lot less crazy, <laughs> a lot less yeah. putting an open flame near my ear. Yeah, and I've had it done by a doctor, which I don't think that they would encourage uh, burning out the wax a doctor would. So I would recommend, hey, if you have if you have a family doctor and uh, you have some problems with uh, hearing, get your ear flushed. It feels great. Yeah, I would really recommend it. Um, so DW, it turns out, is going to have to have an operation. And they're going to essentially put tubes in her ears. In fact, I looked this up on the Wikipedia for this episode. Um, DW has to have tympanostomy tubes surgically implanted into her ear, which can help to handle the blockages that are causing her to not be able to hear. Uh, and DW, of course, so when they say putting tubes in her ear, she's thinking like tubes the size of like vacuum cleaners. So she's imagining that her dad having to push this machine behind her as like these hoses stick out of her ears. Which is this is probably how they solved that problem in like the 30s. <laughs> yeah, if they solved it at all. But thankfully, they're these very tiny tubes. Like I had never heard of this operation before. So this was actually quite informative. Um. When DW goes back home, we see that Arthur is being unusually nice to her. Like, he lets her have the last, it looks like an enchilada, maybe, or something, or burrito. Uh, He even brings her cookies and milk in bed and lets her see whatever movie she wants when the family goes to the movies. Uh, I thought this was, uh, Arthur eventually cops to it. He's like, you are going into, you're going into surgery, and I think that you're being really brave about it, and it, it was really cute. Like, I feel like... It was er- cute, but also, DW was fine until Arthur said that. Like, had Arthur not been like, oh, I'm being so nice because, you know, you're going to surgery, and surgery is like a pretty big deal. Uh, DW would have literally showed up to the hospital, been put to sleep, had the whole thing, and we wouldn't really need... I mean, this is nitpicking because the, the, we need this conversation to happen for the whole second half of the episode to exist. Uh, but it's really Arthur who kind of, for lack of a better term, starts putting rats in her head and being like, yeah, it's, you're, like, calm, cool, and collected. This is a crazy situation. And DW's like, what? It's 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 serious? I had no idea. But I think that that's necessary because Arthur, like, like you kind of alluded to, we need a conflict for this episode, and especially because we've discovered that the DW episodes are kind of made for younger kids. If we're going to be talking about, you know, what it's like to have a surgery... It's it is kind of scary, and we have to get to that point eventually. Like DW can't just go in there and be uh, kind of ignorant of the of whatever a surgery is. And I thought that this I'll put it to you this way: I feel like an earlier episode, like if this had occurred in like season two, then there, we would have had a subplot of Arthur struggling to be nice. Like he would have had to be told to mom by mom that like. Arthur, you have to be very nice to your sister. This is a big surgery she's going to have. And Arthur just being like, like bringing her cookies and being like, here you go. Like doing it through gritted teeth. But Mm. it was actually super sweet at this point in the show for Arthur to just be like, no, I'm just, 
being nice to you because this is a big deal. And yes, you're right. He does kind of put the thought in her head that this is like more like more. Um, this is a bit hairier than she originally thought that it was going to be. But we had to get there eventually, and it's I true. thought that it was uh, it was very nice to see Arthur kind of taking the initiative and being a good big brother. Yeah, but Arthur is really kind of the the kind of champ of this episode, and I, I agree that he is being. Um, it's sweet to see him be almost uncharacteristically nice to DW given the circumstances. I just think the whole uh, kind of conflict of this episode would have worked a little bit better for me if maybe DW was kind of just already nervous in the first place. Like, she didn't have to, like, someone tell her to freak out about the operation. Maybe if she was just already kind of freaking out from the jump, uh, then it would make it seem less like that Arthur needlessly kind of worried her. Uh, but that aside, but it... I do I do like, uh, I agree that he's like, the the way he's he's kind of uh, catering to her is, is very sweet. But even, but even, you know, with that, it's, I, I find it believable that DW at this point would probably have little reason to be like, oh yeah, this'll, this'll just be in and out. Like this won't be a problem at all. And just having to come to the facts of like, mm, sometimes you have to go to the hospital and it's a little bit more complicated than just, you know, a checkup or something, which is probably what she would have been used to. Because at that point, you know, it, when you're really, really little, the only reason you're going to a doctor is because you're sick and they give you some medicine or when you're a baby and they give you your shots and you don't really remember them. So they take her to the pediatric hospital. I love how they portray pediatric workers in this episode. They're very caring. They're very kind. They know exactly how to speak to kids and they're pretty much portrayed as rock stars, which I, I agree. I think they are. It's, I mean, it's a little bit of a, an easy two pointer, but I think it's pretty cool that like, you know, it's not like the conflict is that DW doesn't like her doctor or she doesn't like the nurse or something. No, they're all very nice. And if we're trying to tell kids that it's okay to go to the hospital when you are, you know, when you need an operation or you're in pain or something like that's honestly, that's good. I feel like there's so many reasons for you know, parents these days to make kids distrust going to the hospital sometimes. Mm, mm, yeah, no, no, good. That's a very solid point. Uh, I love so, the decor of the pediatric hospital, all the, like, yeah. murals behind DW, which is getting uh, measured. Uh, there's, like, this crazy tall clown. <laughs> yes, I just saw it. Yeah, there is this, like, clown on, like, stilt pants. Uh, yeah, so... She, I mean, she does all these little tests, of, like basically to measure her height and weight and that, and that stuff, and she thinks that that's it, and just like, oh no, uh, you're going to have to come back again. Uh, one of the things that DW has to worry about this is also very cute because they have to. Um, uh, I, d I don't. They don't give her a shot, but I think they're just like um, measuring her blood pressure, and she's like, "You can sit on your dad's lap if you want to," and she's and she's like, "No, that's okay," and Dad's like, "You sure?" and like. Oh, okay, well, if it'll make you feel better, but but it's like okay, I do need I do need to be on your lap. It was actually very very cute. Um, but eventually, DW realizes that what they're going to do it's it's an operation where they have to put her under with anesthesia, and this is something that I didn't have to worry I didn't have to think about until I was much older. DW asking like, what if I wake up during the operation? And that's like a real adult fear is waking up under anesthesia. Like they've made movies about that. Mm, 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 mm. True. And that's like it's like it's like you know it's an adult level fear and it's a lot for a little kid to think about. But again, it kind of goes to the uniform like at every turn everybody is saying like don't worry the doctors know exactly what they're doing that's not going to happen and thankfully everything you know spoilers everything goes well so if you're tr again if you're trying to sow trust among kids in doctors and medical professionals they go about it in in the right way this it almost feels like an educational episode in that sense but i again i feel like this is still very important because there's i mean as you get older you realize that even your medical professionals aren't necessarily the most trustworthy people. Mm, true, true, true. Uh, we get this, this, all of these kind of uh, sunshiny and 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 really kind of heroic and and warm portrayals of medical professionals are now contrasted with this dream sequence uh, DW has, where her preschool teacher and the Tibble twins are the ones that are going to perform an operation on her uh, in some sort of cave. Uh, and yeah. they have a, 
what is it? Let me get the exact name right on this. The Bravo meter. The Bravo meter. Which yeah. uh, the Tibbles refer to as a Bravoscope. Uh, so hmm. already they don't even know their own equipment. <laughs> uh, and so it's, she's getting her listening ears operation. And and it turns out that DW uh, is is an outlier in that she is uh, one of the most cowardly people they've ever encountered. Uh, the percentages <laughs> here are not good. We see this like it looks like this this kind of readout that we're getting of DW. I don't understand really what's going on here. You know, I'm not a medical professional, but it looks like different components of her body have different percentages of braveness. Uh, it kind of <laughs> looks like in like the Fallout games when you're using vats or something. Uh, but we we see that uh, yeah, her hair is 12 percent, her face 20, her arms 15. Hey, solidly brave torso. 48 percent ain't bad. That means you're basically taking a risk one half of the time when you're taking any risks. You know what I mean? I, I would love to be 50% brave. Uh, mm-hmm. And then, ooh, these legs, yikes, 5% brave in the legs. So uh, they're kind of that, – that's they break the bad news to DW uh, that she's a coward. And she'll probably never be able to swing swim without water wings is is their uh, summation, which is so this kind of compounds DW's anxiety that like everybody is like before that dream sequence everybody keeps saying how brave she is and she doesn't even feel particularly brave which I think is a pretty it's a pretty complex thing to think about about how a lot of times when somebody's going in for surgery or when somebody's in the hospital a lot you 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 know one of the common things you say is how brave you are. Or, or at least it can be. And I, and I know that sometimes the feeling is with patients that, like, well, I don't feel brave. I'm just kind of doing this because I have to. So DW struggling with that in a very small way. She even tries to convince Dad that, like, her hearing is all better. And she's like, I can hear the TV loud and clear, even though it's like, but it's muted. You see? I can hear even better than before. Uh, but that's because she's. But that's because she is starting to get scared about the, the operation. But thankfully, everything is a okay. We even had a really sweet moment here where DW gets to pick out the type of pajamas that she has. Uh, she gets like a sticker for being the number one uh, patient there. We even get a cameo from Arthur's lucky pencil. He so, gives DW a little mark on her hand. I was very very happy to see the lucky pencil, a season one artifact, uh, show up again. But I was dismayed when he marked her hand with it. I don't know about you, Will, but number two pencil on the hand doesn't really work. Like, that's a... I was like, pencil on skin? Ugh. Like, that's a weird sensation. And usually you can end up puncturing your top layer of skin doing such a thing. Yeah. It's not like I, a I'm... pen where you can have an easy or a marker. Uh, marking your head with a, a pencil is a dicey maneuver. You get the, get the tip of the lead stuck in there. Ugh. Give me the heebie-jeebies. Also... I think his pencil grew. Um, if I'm to remember correctly, the lucky pencil was like, I guess we don't know where this takes place in the lore. This could have been smack dab in the middle of the lucky pencil episode. That's that's, that's my guess, yeah. Uh, but because, but it was a nub the last time we saw it. All that being said, yeah, pencil on skin. Ugh, gives me the heebie-jeebies. I'm sure Arthur was perfectly was perfectly careful. But yeah, no, I understand. It's not what you necessarily want to be marking on your hand. Uh, as DW goes into the operation, Dad's going to go in with her. She says, everybody loves me. I'm the number one patient. Um, DW gets put out by the anesthesia. This is something that, like, so I've, I'm anxious about a lot of really weird and silly things. One of the things that really used to bother me is that I don't know what it feels like to fall asleep, if, you, if that makes sense. Like... I when you're when you're laying in bed, it kind of trips me out sometimes. If you think about one moment you're asleep, and then the next moment you're not, and I can't and I can't remember what that moment is when I fall asleep. So it always freaks me out a little how effectively anesthesia puts you to sleep. I've only had it once, and I remember like you know the old the old cliche is like count backwards from a hundred, and I remember I got to like maybe ninety, and then just out. And it was like, it's really crazy how it's able to do that. I don't know. Uh, just felt like mentioning that, I guess. So DW See, enduring- I, last time I was under anesthesia, I think I was getting my tonsils removed or something, and they had me on that good, good. So I don't even remember it kicking in. You know what I mean? I was <laughs> yeah. just having a good old time. So in her dream under anesthesia, DW is protecting a unicorn from like a, a troll. Not a troll. Like a... Like a uh, 
would this be? An imp, maybe? A gnome? A dwarf? A dwarf? A gnome. Anyway. Uh, 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 some sort of... Uh, uh, a... Yeah. Let's go with troll. <laughs> troll. Well, it's, it's protecting a unicorn from being shot by a bow and arrow, and she ha- has, like, a superhero costume with a cape and everything, and giant floppy ears, even longer than Buster's ears. Yeah, she looks and like she Mighty the... Mouse. Yeah, a little bit. And she has... She is dreaming about being super ear girl who can, like, has the best hearing in the universe or something like that. So, super ear girl. (laughs) And eventually she's woken up by mom and dad, and it's a classic, I'm ready for the operation, just like, well, the operation already happened. And usually, I'd I'd say more often than not, that's how surgeries go, thankfully. And the it was such a success that DW can hear even better than before. She hears Arthur muttering on the phone about how much better her hearing is. And then she decides that she 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 looks in Arthur's ears with like a t- little toy uh not not stethoscope, but whatever whatever the thing is you look in ears with. I'm sure I'm I'm sure I know the word, but it's not coming to me. And it's just like, wow, no blockage, but it looks like there's no brain. So we're gonna have to have a brain operation on you. That's a classic my dad. Uh, line is looking <laughs> in my ear and saying, "Oh my gosh, I can see the other end." And uh, yeah, that's the end. Is that Arthur runs out of the room because he does not want to have his brain operated on, at least not today. Okay, so I would really like to know what we think about both of these episodes because I wonder if there's going to be a little bit of disagreement. Perhaps let's uh, rewind to Binky versus Binky. How did this Binky episode strike you, Lucas? I wouldn't say it's in, like, the, the, you know, Binky episodes are usually the cream of the crop. Uh, I think every season since season one, there's been a Binky episode in my top five. And I don't think it's going to be this one this season. I, I really liked it, uh, but I don't think it was, like, some sort of exceptional episode or, or one of the super memorable episodes of season ten. Perfectly serviceable, uh, fun, felt like it flew by. I think you commented on that. I I, I thought it was enjoyable, uh, just not one of my favorite or anything like that. Uh, I also think it's kind of dated and soured by the presence of, of uh, Vance Legstrong. That's not the, the fault of the episode. It was obviously made before his scandals, but going back and watching it now, I, I can't help but, like, that's all I'm thinking about. Uh, though I did like the stuff with, uh, Binky talking to his ghost, and, uh, I liked that they used kind of, like, bicycle races as, as the backdrop of kind of the second half. Uh, all that being said, though, it was not the most kind of engaging episode for me. What about yourself? I liked it. I, like, I liked it fine. I really liked some of the stuff that they were, like, putting forward. I'm always interested in the ways that, in, and, and... Also, the the varying ways that the show tackles anxiety. It's it's actually kind of a theme of the show now, from all the different ways they've tackled how, and I guess and as a kid, it's like overcoming fear and all that kind of thing. But really, the way that they often portray it is like, this is how anxiety feels like to me. So dealing with performance anxiety and kind of negative self-image, I thought that was really strong. Binky's arc, such as it is, was really quick. And you had, I mean, you have to cram a lot into a 12-minute episode, so I don't blame them for it being a little short. It just also felt like he got there very quickly and got over his problem rather quick. So yeah, it's not the it's you know there's it's not as funny or as like charming as other Binky episodes. But I really commend them for continuing to approach uh, fear and anxiousness in the ways that they do. And so I think that it uh, uh, it's it's a, it's an overall positive for me. I would say I'm more positive on. Uh, Operation DW, and again, I, I, I this is the classic. I don't want to harp on this, but there's like so many episodes in a season that eventually I end up harping on something. And with this, it's that it's clear that DW episodes are for little little kids. But I'm happy that this was talking to little kids because this is something that is not often addressed in children's media. I want to say, and. It, I felt like it dealt with a lot of fears that kids can have that are really realistic. You know, I, I feel like sometimes if you if you have an episode of a kid's cartoon where a kid is going to the doctor's office and like, oh, no, I don't want to go. It's like, oh, the doctor's going to be mean or something or something to that effect. But it's like from the jump, it's like, no, doctors are very kind and caring people, especially towards children. So we're dealing with like, what happens if I wake up during an operation? What is an operation like? Um 
da 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 da. And so I felt like it was very realistic fears that little kids would have. And of course, you think about the fact that there are a lot of little kids out there who unfortunately are hospitalized at very young ages. So to have somebody who is DW's age going through this, it's one thing, you know, if Arthur and his friends go to the hospital, but to have DW go to the hospital for something that is an operation that will, you know, I'm guessing will affect her for the rest of her life is, I think is important. And I think they did it in a way that really makes it feel like it's, it's okay. And it's normal. It's normal. It's normal to feel afraid. It's normal to, it's normal to not feel as brave as people tell you that you are, which again is kind of a bit of a heady concept. And it's, uh, I'm glad they introduced it here. And it was also just very pleasant at points. I thought there were a couple of funny DW instances of her being clever, but I just thought that this left me with a very good feeling. And not to repeat myself, because I've said this a couple of times, but it is just kind of nice to remember a time where the message was, it's okay to have faith in the systems that are supposed to protect us, I guess. Maybe I, 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 I'm reading too much into it, potentially, as a 30-year-old, but it's nice to remember a time, you know, living living with my wife and learning about, you know, she's had a lot of experiences where going to the doctor involves basically fighting with them to assert the fact that she is sick. And it was something, that, it's an experience I've never had, and it's opened me up to understanding a lot more people who are like, my doctor doesn't think that I'm sick, or my doctor won't prescribe me. And you realize that doctors are just people, and sometimes, a lot of times, they can end up making mistakes. So this was, it was almost a nice fantasy to go back to when, to being a kid and remembering that, like, a doctor will take care of you. And so in a way, I thought that was really nice, and I think that that is still, I wouldn't say it's a lie you have to tell kids, but it's something, it's a necessary part of their growing up, is you have to have them trust in their medical professionals, because some of them will be seeing them for the rest of their lives, some of them won't, and I thought that this was a really good way of doing that. So it left me with a positive feeling. Yeah, for me, like, I, I I think my problem with the episode is I agree with everything you said, especially with that, and we've come to learn this, is that the DW episodes are, are for a younger audience than the traditional Arthur audience. And thus, you know, the morals they tell might be a little bit less either nuanced or a little bit, like, it's morals intended for that audience. And I think as a piece of, of media intended to kind of... Um, calm kids down in the face of the the medical process right like this is it reminds me of those picture books um and this is kind of morbid like but you know like picture books where it's like rabbits and it's like oh daddy's going to prison like there's like picture books like that that are meant for very specific situations to kind of explain something a little bit more complicated but to a very young kid this had the very similar vibe to me of like Oh, like you have an operation. This is what it's gonna look like, and it's like a a picture book you get your your kid about what that that process is gonna be like, so they know what they're going in into. They know what they're getting into, and they're not scared of it. Um, I think as uh, something trying to do that, it's very effective. I think as uh, an adult watching an episode of Arthur, I thought it was a little boring. And I just kind of sure. wasn't very engaged with it because I, for one, knew everything was going to be fine with DW. Of uh, course. I, I, yeah. I, I knew that, uh, <laughs> you know, it, they weren't going to have to pull in Dr. House uh, to figure out that, like, DW has some sort of weird ear mutation that's never been seen before. I was like, I, I, I bet DW's going to have this operation. It's going to go well. And then she's going to wake up. Uh, so with my adult brain, and this is an unfair criticism of R for whenever we, we pull this, but hey. That's the show where we're in, Will. Uh, my adult brain was a little bit bored because I knew what, where it was going. Uh, so, yeah, that's 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 basically my main criticism of the episode is I think it, it perfectly uh, accomplishes what it's trying to do. It's just not for me. I completely understand, and I think that the, that's a... Uh... It, it not being for you, I think, is a very valid criticism, and I and I totally get that. I think it's it's also like I'm a little bit more of a of a, a mushy, cutesy, wootsy kind of guy. So when when the episode got kind of cute, other than the doctor's name, I it it, it kind of got me. I guess I was in the mood for it. Yeah, I kind of thought that we might differ on that one, but I completely see where you're coming from, and uh, I'm glad that we had. I, I feel like at least this this pair was entertaining. I feel like the second half of season ten is kind of making up ground for the first half. Mm, I, I agree. I think it's on an upswing. 
and I certainly hope that it continues. We've only got two episodes of Season 10 left, and we're going to be getting into another one very soon. Uh, of course, coming up next week for us, we are going to be going back to the Patreon for another episode of For the Kids, a PBS Kids podcast, and we have our first ever Patreon poll to decide the next show we are going to be uh, viewing, and they are all ep- uh, shows that I've never seen, and Lucas, I think I'm, I, I don't think you've seen any of them either. Uh, I've seen, I think, two of them. Uh, if you want, you okay. should you should run down the shows just so, you know, we, we ran down them on the last Patreon episode. But if any listeners uh, want to participate, this is like uh, <laughs> I I uh, registered for the, the Green Party of Canada so I could vote for their leadership election. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so very similarly, if you want to register as a Elwood City Limits Patreon subscriber just to vote on our next episode of For the Kids, uh, Will, for the uninitiated, you should run them down. What are we? What are the choices we're looking at? Okay, so I will say that Miriam uh, Hadid, Dimitri Debar. <laughs> oh wait, no, wrong one, wrong one. So I will say that this poll went live uh, on Sunday. We're recording this on Monday the twenty eighth. So you have from Sunday the twenty seventh, which has already passed, and the poll will end at 11.59 on Sunday, October 4th. And the choices are between Word Girl, Martha Speaks, Maya and Miguel, and Booba. If you want to see which one is winning, we currently have 20 votes uh, cast, so we're looking at a lot more votes that could be coming in by Sunday. So hey, if you're a patron, don't forget to get your vote in there, and we will be doing an episode of whichever one wins, and you have until Sunday. And then, when we come back to Arthur in two weeks on another new episode of ECL, we're going to be talking about Do You Speak George? and World Girls. Now, I think World Girls is one that we've had a couple of people... Uh, talk to us about over the over the years and kind of mention it as a favorite or as just a notable episode coming up so we might have some uh we might have some feedback coming in about that who knows and thank you everybody for listening to this episode we're happy to uh to hear from you and to be heard again and uh yeah we're gonna keep it going and we're by the next time you hear from us well actually lucas now that i think about it but by the time they hear this episode it's gonna be the spooky season Oh my goodness gracious, I can hardly wait, Will. I know, I'm so excited to watch horror movies. I'm already seeing Halloween decorations, even though it's, you know, the world is the way it is. You can still celebrate Halloween times, and I certainly hope that you're getting excited for it, because I know that I am, and I think you are too, Lucas. Oh no, I'm very excited. All right, so we will see you next time on Elwood City Limits or on the Patreon, wherever it is. We can't wait to see and, well, to hear from you and to be there for you. My name's Will Young, and for Lucas Mancini... I've fallen asleep in many strange places. Hmm. I actually, there was there was a quote near the end of the second episode that I thought was going to was be Was it, yours. everybody loves me, I'm the number one patient? No, it was one after that, and I can't remember what it is now, but I specifically didn't write it down because I'm like, that's a Lucas end quote if I've ever heard one. Oh my goodness, now the audience will never know. mm, You'll have to see it for yourself. Until next time, everybody, so long.